Hello, everyone. Hopefully you guys can all hear me. Um, pleased to uh, invite everyone to the first GSE event of the 2021 to 2022 season. Uh, my name is Vincent Wang, Program Chair for the GSE. Uh, today, I'm pleased to host the virtual wine and cheese event, um, where we present the annual Morgan Stern and Canadian Geotechnical Conference Award winner. Um, this event is meant to highlight the outstanding achievements and hard work by graduate students studying geotechnical engineering at the U of A. Uh, the GSC would like to thank its sponsors and the University of Alberta for providing today's Zoom meeting services. Also, please note that today's event will be recorded and screenshots may be taken by Fernanda and posted to the U of A's geotechnical webpage and uh, social media platforms. Um, today's agenda will include the three student speakers, Gabriella Wall, winner of the 2021 Ann Arbor Morgan Stern Award, um, Yiwen uh, Vicky Jang, she's the Canadian Geotechnical Conference Award winner, and Sobrab Sharafi, the Canadian uh, Geotechnical uh, Conference uh, student presenter. Um, due to the virtual format this year, we were able to squeeze in a, an extra presentation. I think that's great because uh, these students have all done great work. Um, so uh, without further ado, we'll just kick into the first one here. Uh, this, year's this year's Morgan Stern Award recipient is Gabriella Wall. Uh, just some background about the Morgan Stern Award. It's been presented annually by the GSE since 1989, and it's presented to the graduate student who submits the best paper as selected by a committee of professors in the geotechnical group at the U of A. Um, Usually we would host this in an in-person format and um, at the faculty club with fancy wine and cheese, but this year we'll have to have it virtually, unfortunately, and hopefully we'll be able to go back to in-person events soon. So without further ado, uh, Gabriella Wall presenting analysis of surface infiltration through acid generating waste rock at the Ferro Mine. Uh, Gabriella Wall is currently uh, completing her MSc in Geoenvironmental Engineering at the University of Alberta. She graduated with her BSc in Civil Environmental Engineering from the U of A co-op program in 2018 and continues to take specific interest in mine waste remediation. She will be speaking on her research project, which focuses on analyzing infiltration through acid generating waste rock at the Ferro Mine. As part of a larger project, Gabriella is contributing to the generation of reactive transport model that seeks to understand acid generation in the main dump at Ferro Mine. By quantifying the water balance at the surface of the main dump, she will, able, she will be able to provide the reactive transport model, the necessary boundary conditions in the form of net percolation. Um, so I will hand it over to her now. Perfect, thank you so much, Vincent. Um, and I just wanted to say before I start, thank you to the GSC and Vincent for their hard work in organizing today's event. Um, as well, thank you to Fernanda from the Geotechnical Center for hosting us. It's greatly appreciated. Um, and so I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen here. And hopefully you will be able to see it. <laughs> yes, perfect. Perfect. Um, so yeah, today um, I'm going to be speaking on my uh, thesis research, which is, which is focused on analyzing surface infiltration through acid generation rating waste rock at Ferro Mine. Um, and just before I begin, I would like to thank CERNAC and NSERC's Terranet program for supporting our research. Uh, thank you to Parsons and the University of Waterloo for their support on site. Um, and a special thank you to Dr. Ward Wilson and Dr. Ahlam Abdelnabi for their mentorship and support on this project. And also I would just like to acknowledge that currently in Edmonton, we are located on Treaty 6 territory, which is the traditional land of First Nations and Métis people. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that the land we conducted our research on is situated on the traditional territory of the Casca Ross River Dene First Nations. Um, and the environmental impacts of the research location itself um, also affect the traditional territory of the Selkirk First Nations, which is located downstream of Ferro Mine. And so I just wanted to start by giving a bit of background on Ferro Mine for those who might not know about it. Um, so Ferro Mine is located 15 kilometers north of the town of Ferro, which is approximately 200 kilometers north of Whitehorse in the Yukon. Um, so at the peak of its time, the Ferro Mine Complex was one of the world's largest lead and zinc mining operations. 
Um, but unfortunately, in 1998, it was abandoned due to the bankruptcy of the Anvil Mining Corporation. Um, and so I have a figure here on the right um, that shows the mine itself. And next to the uh, pit here, you can see that there's um, a formation here, which is the waste rock dump. Um, and so this, the east portion of this waste rock dump alone was constructed from 1972 to 1990, and it accumulated 46.4 million tons of sulfide bearing waste rock. Um, that is a significant amount of material, and now it's left uh, to remediation. And unfortunately, this material is acid generating and is currently one of the largest environmental threats to downstream receptors. Uh, so remediation efforts are in the planning phase and they aim to prevent further acid generation over time. So in efforts to assist remediation efforts um, for the waste rock pile, a site-specific reactive transport model is being developed. And so these tools help predict the leachate quality and quantity from porous media such as waste rock. These models are extremely complicated systems as they have to consider the geochemical, biological, and physical properties of the waste rock itself. Um, and so my research focuses on providing the surface flux boundary conditions um, in the form of net percolation. So by assessing the water balance over varying climate scenarios, I'll be able to provide a range of boundary conditions to help determine the best performing remediation strategies for uh, the main waste rock dump. So in order to determine the net percolation over time, the first step of my research was to uh, conduct field investigation. And I was lucky enough to get to Faro Mine in the fall of 2019. And the initial scope of my work was to include 10 test pit locations um, on the surface of the main dump. But due to equipment availability on site, um, I completed surface sampling to a depth of about 30 centimeters at three different test locations. And each of these test locations were chosen near previous uh, sites of investigation conducted by the University of Waterloo in 2017. And so in situ testing was the main focus of this field investigation um, as the structure specifically at the top or the surface materials of the waste rock dump are heavily influenced by traffic um, and other weather conditions. Um, so I need to be able to measure um, in situ parameters on the surface in, at site. So Guelph permeameter tests were completed to measure the field saturated hydraulic conductivity. Um, the sand replacement method was used to measure the in-situ density and multiple jet fill tensiometers were used to measure the matrix suction over the duration of our field investigation. Um, and then additional samples were taken for lab analysis. So once the field investigations were completed, I moved on to um, completing soil classification. And so parameters derived from the grain size distribution classifies the surface samples as having a soil-like behavior. So this indicates that the matrix materials will govern the movement of moisture through this material. And so it'll be important to characterize the soil water characteristic curve and any, and any other unsaturated uh, soil parameters going forward. So in addition to field and lab parameters, um, meteorological data is also really important um, in running these numerical simulations. So in this specific data set I was provided, um, hourly precipitation was recorded starting in 2003, and the meteorological parameters such as wind speed, net radiation, and air temperature were available um, from 2017 onwards. All meteorological parameters were recorded hourly, um, with the exception of the relative humidity, which was recorded daily. And so with all of the input parameters I found, I moved on to defining my numerical model and any assumptions I'd be using. So currently these simulations were completed using SVFlux, which is a multi-dimensional transient saturated unsaturated flow model. So this couples the physical principles of water flow through porous media such as the waste rock uh, with atmospheric moisture demands. And this helps us calculate the water balance equation shown on the slide here. Um, and as you can see, the water balance equation seems fairly arithmetically simple. So we have uh, precipitation, which we know, um, but the runoff and the actual evaporation components um, are where SV flux comes into play to help me estimate. Uh, many inputs are needed to estimate actual evaporation alone, um, and runoff tends to be extremely computationally demanding. Um, so that's why we use numerical models to simulate uh, the water flow. 
And so the geometry I'm using to model this problem is fairly simple. Um, so it's a 1D column that represents the depth of the material sampled, um, where I'm applying a climate boundary to the surface, which is determined through all the meteorological data, um, and a review boundary condition applied to the bottom, uh, which represents a natural flow and unknown output condition, since we don't know how fast or how much water will flow out of the bottom of our soil column. And so the initial conditions for the model are taken from in situ measurements of matrix suction, um, which the geometric mean was seen to be about 42 kPa um, at steady state cases. Um, and that'll be used as a base case scenario. Uh, furthermore, I've made certain assumptions, um, such as this model will not consider the effects of freeze thaw um, and vegetation on the water balance. So dates for simulations in each scenario that I'll be going through in a little bit um, have been chosen so that the air temperature and the soil temperature are above zero degrees um, at the sampling depth. And so in addition, minimal vegetation was seen on the surface. So it's likely that it's an insignificant portion of the water balance. And so thinking about the bigger picture for this research project, it's beneficial to run multiple climate scenarios so that you have a range of boundary conditions. And that will allow um, the University of Waterloo to test the rigor of the reactive transport model um, to predict different outflows from the waste rock pile. And so three climate scenarios have been chosen, uh, which were a wet year, um, which was seen to be 2017, the average year, which was seen to be 2018, um, and then the largest event um, in the data I had was recorded in August of 2017, um, and those will be used to assess the water balance moving forward. And so knowing all of the model inputs and assumptions, now I'll talk about the initial results um, for the extreme event analysis. And so this event was found uh, to fall, have about 38 millimeters precipitation falling over a 24 hour period. And so I ran a water balance for around 72 hours to see if there was extended percolation um, or any effect of evaporation on the storage of water um, in that soil column. And so this base case was ran as an unsaturated system initially to that field condition of 42 kPa of matrix suction. And so the overall result of this uh, analysis showed that 41% of the total event uh, resulted in net percolation and there was no runoff generated. Um, so when you look at this one tiny column of water, 41% of 38 millimeters doesn't seem like much. But when you look at the entire surface of the waste rock dump, um, that 41% of uh, infiltration over the entire surface is a significant quantity. Um, and the fact that we're not losing water to runoff is also something that's important to note. Um, and again, for this event, it's reasonable for there to be an absence of runoff. Um, as the rainfall intensity that we have recorded here um, did not exceed the average field saturated hydraulic conductivity that I used in the simulation. Um, so it won't generate any runoff unless um, that rainfall intensity was higher or the uh, saturated permeability was lower. And so looking at that, I wanted to see, okay, if I started with a more saturated system, would there um, be any effect on the water balance as well? And so in this scenario, I increased the pore pressure of the initial starting condition. And so ideally I would have been able to achieve a near zero KPA initial pressure, um, but these simulations are computation, uh, computationally demanding um, and I wasn't able to achieve a solution past this point. Um, there were discontinuities mathematically created due to um, large changes in the climate inputs. Um, and so this is the closest I could get to initial saturated uh, solution. And so this uh, solution, even with a 20 kPa reduction in matrix, uh, matrix suction, resulted in a 10% increase in net percolation. And um, so we've gone from about 41 to 51%. Um, so it is a significant amount that's uh, infiltrating when we have an initially saturated system. Um, and again, there was no runoff generated. Um, so that's important to note. And so looking at the overall water balance, um, we can see that the net percolation happens in direct response to rainfall events. Um, so if you look here, um, there is a little bit of a lag with the net percolation, um, but otherwise um, it directly responds to the rainfall itself. Um, and 
So this to me indicates that the material at the surface is so dry um, that the water has no resistance to moving through the pore space. Um, and the subsequent infiltration capacity is governing the overall infiltration behavior um, in this system at, this, um, at these conditions with these meteorological parameters. Um, so looking at this figure here, uh, this is the Guelph permeameter measured, uh, Guelph permeameter results measured from one of our test locations. So you can clearly see the effects of the infiltration capacity here where the water starts to move through the sample at an accelerated rate. And as the water seeps through the soil matrix and the um, soil starts to wet up, um, it eventually goes to a steady state um, where the permeation of water is controlled by the field capacity um, rather than um, having it so dry and that you have no movement of water through. And so um, another initial condition or initial conclusion that we were able to see um, was that um, ponding will most likely incur, occur in regions uh, with topographic depressions um, and areas with increased fines. And those might not have been captured during our sampling program. So you can see here in this figure, this was a feature that was seen on the top of the waste rock dump. Um, and you can see that there was um, a ponding or a runoff event that lead it, led to this area. Um, and so looking at this figure here, you can see that there's also increased silts. Um, and so um, this will sort of increase or decrease the net percolation, um, depending on where you are locally on the surface of the waste rock dump. Um, so although the simulation that I had showed that there would no, was no net percolation with the parameters I entered, um, there still may be localized variations with increased fines. Um, or different topographic uh, features that will either collect uh, rainwater and pond um, or um, actually allow water to go through uh, faster, which is what we saw with some of the Gulf Permeander tests is we had preferential flow paths um, that were observed. And so there are local variations on the surface and below the surface as well. And so my current focus with this analysis um, is centered on the fact that the simulations I've shown you here today actually don't support the observations on site. Um, so there are observations of runoff on the surface of the main dump um, when there are larger precipitation events. Um, and so therefore I'm going back through the input parameters to ensure that they are representative of the in situ conditions. So my first step is to directly measure the soil water characteristic curve. Um, in place of the numerical simulations I made um, during these initial simulations. So when um, COVID first hit in March of 2020, I had just started some lab tests and unfortunately I had to um, put those on hold. So in order to progress, I had numerical estimations of SWCC. So now I've completed those lab measurements and I'm updating the model um, as I go. Uh, the second, will be to perform sensitivity analyses with varying hydraulic connectivities to see what those material properties um, do to the water balance. Um, so if I went to the extreme end of uh, lower permeability, um, what would happen there? Um, and so that's kind of the second focus. And then the third will be to use updated meteorological data. And so unfortunately, the set of data that I had for these simulations um, had um, negative precipitation readings. Um, and different anomalies uh, that were important to the water balance. So going forward, I'm going to be updating all of those parameters as well to see how they affect the water balance. And so these are just some of the remaining questions I have um, that are kind of uh, summed up by those current focus points. Um, so I'll be conducting more sensitivity analyses, updating the parameters, um, and also figuring out how large of a storm event we actually need to generate runoff um, in different scenarios. So yeah, that's my presentation for today. And I thank you all for your time. I greatly appreciate it. And if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer any. Great, excellent presentation, Gabriella. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, if anyone has any. Do we have any in the chat box, Fernanda? I can't, I can't see it on my end. No, in a chat box, but there's one person with uh, with a hand. James okay. Cito, yeah. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Jack Cito from DGC Engineering. Thank you, Gabriela. That was a wonderful, uh, informative uh, presentation. 
Um, I guess my two questions are one, um, in terms of your soil properties, what was the characteristic, I, what was the finest content of the material, uh, of the material that you, uh, I guess the typical of the sample that you collected? And then secondly, what were your uh, saturated hydraulic conductivity that you were estimating for that? Yeah, so that's great questions. Thank you. Um, so I think the fines content, so silt and clay was about, it was uh, less than 10% um, or at 10%. Um, and then the hydraulic conductivity that I was using for the average um, was about uh, 10 to the minus six meters per second. Um, and I think this varied based on location as well. Um, as well, um, the Guelph permeameter is assessed as either a single or double head method. Um, and so uh, the Guelph permeameter is kind of based on the fact that you'd have a homogeneous material. And what we saw on site was that we ended up with some negative readings during the double head method um, during the results. And that indicates that the material was really heterogeneous. Um, so I went ahead and used the single head method um, permeabilities and took the average just for this um, scenario. Um, so that's where I came up with that number, but I'm going to be revisiting the kind of extremes as well um, based on the different analyses there. Great, thank you. Thank you. Great, so it looks like we're right on time. Um, I'll bring up our next speaker now. So our next speaker uh, is the Canadian Digital Conference Award winner, uh, Yi Wenjiang. Um, she'll be presenting the uh, SPT-based method, SPT -based method uh, for estimating axial capacities of single helix piles and sands. Um, so um, Yi Wenjiang recently received her MSc in Geotechnical Engineering at the U of A, supervised by Dr. Deng. Before that, in 2019, she graduated with a BSc with distinction in civil engineering at the U of A. She currently works as a geotechnical EIT at Wood, and her research was focused on the behavior of helical piles in sand, where she evaluated the soil pile interaction based on field load tests and SVT investigations. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Yuan to present. Thank you, Vincent. Yeah, let me present my story. Uh, thank you, Vincent, for the kind introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Can sorry, one. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Evan. I'm glad to share my research with you. And it's about uh, a SPT-based empirical method for estimating axial capacity of single helix pile in sand. Uh, helical pile are extensively used in Canada. In general, a helical pile. Uh, consists of at least one helical shape bearing plate welded to the central shaft. And this kind of pile are usually screwed into ground by a hydraulic torque rig. And the installation usually requires only two people on a crew and approximately 30 minutes per pile. And uh, uh, helical pile are used in various engineering applications such as uh, power transmission towers, bridges, solar farms, and residential and commercial buildings. Uh, the advantages of helical power include uh, quick installation, cost effectiveness, and the low level of noise and vibration. Um, the power capacity can be predicted using in situ testing results following two methods, indirect method and direct method. For the indirect method, uh, site investigation and the laboratory test are conducted to evaluate the soil parameter and then apply to analytical formula to produce the uh, power capacity. 
But for the direct method, the power capacity is directly related to certain in situ measurements without evaluating any intermediate soil uh, parameters, which enables a quicker design and less uncertainties. And the uh, uh, direct method uh, used when the uh, soil property uh, Estimation is significantly affected by the in situ soil specificity, and the manufacturer has a, uh, access to a vast database of historical direct method application. Um, because the standard penetration test SPT is a popular and economical method in subsurface e exploration, SPT based method becomes one of the direct method uh, commonly used to predict the. Uh, capacities of PALS. Uh, there are a number of SPT uh, based direct method developed for conventional driven PALS in various types of soils. One thing in common shared by those theory is that the uh, SPT N value is related to unit shaft resistance and unit end bearing resistance. Um, Perco extended this theory to the problem of helical piles in sand. Notably, the shaft resistance was neglected in this correlation. So to improve this method, my uh, research crew carried out a series of fellow tests of helical piles in sand. The test site is at the uh, University of Alberta Botanic Garden, which is close to Devon. And the site was selected because it represents typical profile of Alberta cohesionate soil and the soil stratigraphy is relative homogeneous. Uh, this figure shows the layout of the test piles, reaction piles, and SPT boreholes. Three types of single helix power with varied uh, power length, shaft diameter, and helix diameter were tested in compression and tension. And the uh, SPT tests were conducted near the test piles. Mm, the reaction uh, system consists of an I beam and two double helix reaction piles. The reaction beam was fixed to the top of the uh, two reaction piles. The photo on the left shows an overview of test setup, and the photo on the right shows the aligned hydraulic jack, low cell, and uh, uh, test power. The vertical power movements were recorded using two LP, and the average reading of the LPs are used as a power displacement. Uh, two ball holes. Uh, drilled to depths of 8.3 meter, which was greater than the embedment of the longest pile tested in situ. And the two SPT were conducted at 1.5 meter depth interval to determine the N value at different uh, depths. And this table shows the result of the SPT. The N value was corrected as N60 using this equation, and the N60 in this table was the average value of the two boreholes. Uh, during field test, the axial load and displacement were recorded by a data logger. Uh, this is part of the test load result. The ultimate capacity is interpreted from this load versus displacement curve. And in this study, ultimate capacity QU is defined as the power uh, resistance at the axial displacement of 10% of helix diameter. Uh, there are several piles reach the uh, loading frame capacity before the ultimate state in such uh, in such cases, the uh, value of QU was extrapolated to the load at 10% of helix diameter using chain's hyperbolic method. The present test result and available test uh, 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 and available result from uh, literature were compiled to construct a load test database of single helix pile and the database includes the test result of uh, 47 single helix power with various uh, dimensions in sandy soils, as shown in here. Except 12 tests 
uh, in the present testing program, uh, 35 load test of single helix power from other published papers. Hello. Hello. Hi, Hi, Vincent. Yeah, I think I lost my connection. Oh. Oh, okay. So try again. Yeah. yeah I'm so sorry. No, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I should okay. be at here. Um. Yeah. Uh, from this slide, uh, the present test result and available uh, result from literature were compelled to construct a low test database of single helix PAL. Uh, the database includes a test result of the, uh, 47 single helix PAL with uh, various dimensions in sandy soil, as shown in this table, uh, except 12 te uh, PAL tests in the present testing program. Uh, 35 low test of single helix PAL were from other published papers. Uh, the ultimate capacity of single helix PAL equals the uh, summation of the uh, helical plate bearing resistance and shaft resistance. Uh, separation of the end bearing resistance from the shaft resistance may be a difficult task because in the presence uh, research and published literature did not directly uh, measure either component. The reason of taking shaft friction into consideration is that a number of studies indicate the uh, shaft resistance really contribute a significant share, up to 30% to the total axle capacities. Uh, Galli et al. conducted 56 uh, small-scale tests in dense, medium dense, and loose dry sand. They found that due to the soil disturbance caused by helical power installation, the delta over fire ratios were greatly affected. Delta here is a friction angle of the disturbed soil. The ratio delta over phi equals to 1 in loose sand, uh, 0.8 in medium dense sand, and 0.65 in dense sand. Therefore, a modification factor alpha is applied to this correlation between QS and NBAR with regard to different soil behavior type as shown in this equation one. Mm, then the modified correlation between QS and NBAR can be written as two times alpha times NBAR. The coefficient of two was obtained from SPT-based direct method of conventional straight paths. Uh, it is assumed that the uh, shaft friction of uh, helical piles is similar to the uh, friction, uh, friction of conventional straight piles. Um, in equation one, the sand was classified as loose, medium, dense, and dense. The relationship between sand type and N from Merhoff was used. Um, from 4 to 10 stand for loose sand, 10 to 30 stand for medium dense sand, and 30 to 50 stand for dense sand. After selecting the appropriate um, modification factor alpha, the frictional uh, resistance of power shaft was calculated and then subtracted from QU to produce uh, unit and bearing uh, resistance QB. The unit and bearing resistance of PAL were plotted in this figure against MB. A best lin fit linear regression suggests a slope of 73.3. The uh, QB versus MB correlation in this figure uh, demonstrated a large variation, especially when QB range from uh, 500 to 1500 kilopascal. Um, and this would be anticipated for any 
are SPT-based approaches. Nonetheless, the data point uh, show that improved linear relationship uh, as QB increased. A value of R square, uh, R square means the coefficient of determination is uh, 0.8076. And this R square value suggests the uh, correlation may be still acceptable for a uh, practical application. And this figure also shows a 95% of prediction ban. And for this prediction ban, um, and this prediction ban contains 95% uh, of future data if the uh, experiment is to be repeated. Uh, combining the uh, shaft uh, resistance and end bearing resistance presented previously, the ultimate capacity to uh, estimate single helix power incident is suggested with this bullet equation. And in this equation, NB means the average N around the helix, and N bar means the average N along the power shaft length. AB is the total projected area of a helical bearing plate and AS is the area of soil shaft interface and alpha is a modification factor due to a soil disturbance. This correlation offers a larger NB value, which is 73.3 than Perko dictate 3.8 and allows a consideration of shaft resistance. Uh, in the end, to conclude this presentation, uh, the present study presented a series of uh, field axial loading tests of single helix pal in sand. And the soil stratigraphy was character, uh, characterized by in situ SPT. Uh, the test result was then used to develop a database. And from this database, uh, direct method based on SPT for estimating uh, the axial capacity of single helix pile is proposed. And in this proposed equation, the end bearing coefficient is 73.3 and the shaft coefficient is two times alpha. Alpha here is a modification factor. In contrast to Perko's equation, the shaft resistance is taken into account. And this modification is critical to uh, for a long pile whose shaft carries a considerable amount of load. And uh, in addition, the uh, installation induced soil disturbance is probably handled with the factor alpha. Acknowledgement. Uh, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to Dr. Deng for his continued support and the wise guidance throughout my research program. I also truly appreciate NSRIC, uh, Matax Acceleration Program, and Reaction Pelling Inc. for providing funding for this project and myself. Uh, and that's bring us to the end. I'd like to thank you uh, for your time and attention. If anyone has any question, uh, please feel free to ask and I will do my best to answer. Great, thanks for the presentation, Yuan. Um, I think we have time for maybe one question. Yeah. Go ahead, Yao. Thanks for the presentation. I got a question. You just mentioned uh, you specify this method for single helix pile. Uh, what do we do with like what situation with uh, multiple helix pile? Um. Uh, that's a. Uh, thanks for your question. That's a really good question. Uh, as for multi helix pile, the axial capacity is dependent on the interaction between uh, helical plates. When the, um, when the plate to plate uh, spacing decreases to a critical value, the soil in between the helix uh, maybe form a cylinder like what we, uh, like what we saw in the left uh, photo on the left. And this soil cylinder will act as a region body during the displacement of the, uh, of the pile. Uh, this inter-soil sharing behavior cannot be characterized by the correlation proposed for the soil shaft sharing. Uh, however, our current understanding of the uh, critical plate-to-plate -plate, uh, spacing is 
still uh, unsatisfa unsatisfactory. Uh, therefore, we cannot apply this SPT method to the design of multi helix pal. I hope that addresses your question. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, I think uh, we'll move on to the next presentation. Thank you sure. very much, Yuen, for your time. Uh, thank sure. you, Vincent. Okay. I don't know. Okay, um, our last but not least presentation is by Sarab Sharafi. He'll be presenting on uh, reduction of stochastic noise and in instrumentation readings, a comparison of simple moving average and the Savatsky Gole filters. Uh, Sarab has a master's in geotechnical engineering from Iran where he conducted different research projects and is now conducting his PhD at the U of A under the supervision of Dr. Hendry and Dr. Masiota. Uh, Sarab is working on enhancing the capacities of landslide monitoring with a focus on the ones in the prairies. He will present his recent work on improving the reliability of early warning systems by minimizing the noise in the readings of instruments. And I will let you take it from here. Thank you very much. Uh, so let me pull up my slides here. Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, so without any further ado, let's get started. Uh, I'd like to start this presentation with a very brief introduction. Uh, on left, the figure one shows the landslide susceptibility map of Canada published by the government in 2012. And uh, colors of yellow, green, and red indicate medium to high risk of such geohazard and uh, it's seen that the slope stability issue is a concerning one within prairies. And this actually highlights the significance of landslides monitoring uh, strategies. Early warning systems uh, have been proven as a robust means to this end, and in which the surficial and subsurficial acquisitions of instruments are fit into that and based on the displacement, velocity, and acceleration of ground and early warning system issues of warning when the ground is accelerating or a collapse might be imminent. Well, uh, however, these readings of instruments are always obscured because of noise, which can also affect the performance of an early warning system. Uh, in figure two on the right, you see the horizontal displacement of 10 mile landslide reported by GeoCube within a 25 day period. I will talk about it uh, a little bit later on, but these small fluctuations in displacement diagram have led to formation of cloud of points in the velocity diagram on the right, which obviously is not suitable when monitoring uh, ground motions. <clears throat> so to resolve this issue, practitioners and researchers usually um, use simple moving average or SMA to minimize these adverse effects. Uh, like as you can see its formulation on the left. At any moment, simple moving average takes the arithmetic average of surrounding observations as the filtered value. And the window size or P determines how far this averaging should extend. So if we apply simple moving average on the diagrams that I showed you in the previous slide, a much more sensible results will be obtained, for example, as the ones you can see in figure three. Uh, but at this moment, I faced with some questions. Uh, how can we accommodate for real-time monitoring, because it's the case for early warning system? Is there any assumption that we should make for that in the filtration process? And also, uh, how should we choose the window size of these filtration? Because from my perspective, people usually select it either arbitrarily or empirically, and the difference can be really considerable. And more importantly, um, is SMA or simple moving average really good enough? So I started digging into mathematical resources and found a Savitsky-Gulai filter, or SG. 
Uh, this filter also works on a window basis, but instead of averaging, it fits a polynomial on the points in the window and compute the filtered value using that fitted curve. So uh, before delving into the methodology uh, to answer those questions, I'd like to touch on the site that I use its data, uh, the famous 10 mile landslide. It's located in the southeastern of uh, British Columbia and transverse is two important transportation corridors, Highway 99 and CN Railway. Uh, we had 10 geocube units installed on it for almost two years, and they were successfully reporting the land size movement. For those of you who are not familiar with geocubes, there are some sort of a GPS receiver that work with satellites and communicate with satellites to get the uh, relative displacement. So, uh, my supervisors and I developed a detailed mathematical procedure called numerical analysis on synthetic database. So uh, I'm not going to elaborate the whole procedure, uh, but long story short, uh, like we generated a series of known curves that would simulate the kinematics of usual landslides, then added different levels of random noise on them and uh, applied SMA and SG filters to them to see which one provides us with the most accurate results. Uh, well, since we know the actual values, we're also able to uh, uh, calculate error or RMSE. And these bullet points that are listed here uh, show the most noteworthy remarks. First of all, we realized that the filtration window should be non-symmetric and only precedent points must be considered as in real-time monitoring, but not aware of uh, future observations. Also, it was concluded that 4% uh, to 10% of total data points should be uh, actually taken into, into filtration process to have a minimum proper level of uh, smoothness in the results. And as a follow-up to the first point, uh, we observed that non-symmetric window causes a lagged response when using simple moving average. Uh, well, um, well, that's one of the shortcomings of simple moving average. And also, uh, we found out that the SG outperforms SMA, um, and SG was filed, and also the error was uh, lower up to an order of magnitude in comparison to simple moving average. So I used these filters and I, and I applied them to the GeoCube readings of 10 mile landslide that I talked about. And uh, for example, these diagrams show a 200 day period of displacements um, from left to right. Uh, the P or the window size is increasing from 4% of total accusations to 10% of total accusations. It is seen that with increasing the window size or P, uh, the SMA results are showing a higher shift while the SJ results the same intact of this negative effect. And it will also mean that when applying simple moving average, we get the displacement velocity and acceleration at wrong time. And also as more points are taken into account, SMA results seem to lose some curvature in the displacement trend. That means uh, we're losing some information about the displacement rate or velocity. These can be actually more visible in the velocity diagram. So the first row of diagrams belong to SMA results at different window sizes. And the second row of diagrams are showing the, uh, sorry, the SG results. And uh, it is seen that when increasing window size for SMA, peaks and troughs are significantly brought close together. Uh, well, this is not the case for SG filter. And also using SG, as we intensify the filtration or increase the p-value, we are efficiently reducing the fluctuations while not losing any information about the displacement rate of landslide. Uh, so for example, at the day of 300 and p of 10%, SMA suggests that the ground is moving at the rate of two millimeter per day, while uh, SG says it's actually moving at the rate of, uh, for example, 3.5 millimeter day, per day, which is 75% different. Although these numbers uh, may sound like insignificant, but the difference, the 75 difference between these two numbers are, is really significant. And these differences can be life-changing when the landslide is building up to velocity and failure is likely to happen. So we then expanded our studies to quantify the reliability of these filters in regard to detect the onset of acceleration moment, which is also another key moment and a, a very important task uh, done by early warning systems. We adopted the same synthetic database approach and generated accelerating scenarios. And 
again, after adding the noise filtering and back calculated the accelerating moments after application of those filters. So in this diagram, you can see the cumulative probability diagram of detecting onset of acceleration. It shows us that SMA or the blue line actually would uh, reach the 90% confidence almost 23 times later than SG filter, which is another downside of this filter. Well, it means that simple moving average cannot capture the accelerating moment timely while SG can. As an example, if you have a year of readings, SG detects the acceleration moment about 17 hours after the actual time, while this number goes up to 17 days for SMA. That is quite considerable. And then we were really cu curious to see uh, how this would work on forecasting failure time. So eight different cases from literature were gathered and these filters were applied on them using different window sizes and inverse velocity method was used to project the failure time. And since we knew the actual time of the failure time for these cases, we were able to uh, measure the error of the predictions of these filters. So for example, uh, this diagram here in figure nine uh, is an example of results we got for Mount Benny slide in Italy. You can see that for both of the filters, uh, the projection error decreases as we're getting closer and closer to the actual failure. Uh, but the error uh, for SG filter is much less than SMA. Again, showing SMA or simple moving average would not be reliable for these purposes. So you can say that about eight days before the actual failure, SG application of SG could have led to almost exact forecast of failure time. So, all right, I believe that would conclude my presentation, but uh, before finishing it, I'd like to acknowledge the role of our supporters. Uh, this research was made possible by the Railway Ground Hazard Research Program, or RGHRP, which is funded by NSERC, CNCP, and Transport Canada. And RGHRP also includes partnership with Queen's University and Geological Survey of Canada. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much for your presentation, Saurabh. Um, do you have any questions? Do we have any in the chat box, Fernanda? No, not yet. Maybe we need to, need to study the math a bit more, though, sir, sir Rob. <laughs> yeah, I know. All right. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much for your presentation there. Okay. Thank you very much to all the student presenters for their excellent presentations. Um, I know as a grad student, it's a lot of work to put these together and uh, that the few minutes that we get to see your presentations represents months, if not years of labor and hard work. So um, we appreciate all the time you have to present to the, CG, uh, to the GSE here. Um, I wanted to close with a, a reminder of the uh, first CGS national lecture in place of the um, normal CCLT that we usually host. Um, it will be taking place virtually also via Zoom uh, next Wednesday. Uh, November 3rd at 4 p.m. Mountain Time. Uh, and the presenting will be Dr. Doug Stead of UBC. Um, his title is called Applications of Mixed and Virtual Reality in Engineering Geology. So that should be that should prove to be an interesting and techie presentation. Um, I think that's all for me. And I want to thank everyone for joining our presentation this year for a first series of events for the 2021 to 2022 GSE season. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to go back to um, some in-person events next year. And um, thank you very much for everyone's time. And thank you to Fernanda for hosting today's event. Thank you, Vincent, for the great uh, event you put up. And take, thank you, presenters, for the excellent job. And thank you, everyone, that was here with us. And I hope to see you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone.